Today's episode of Market Talk is brought to you by Growmark FS. Keeping up on the latest in ag is a challenge, to say the least. But there are experts nearby ready to help. You'll find them at your local FS. You can trust them to bring you customized agronomic, grain, and energy solutions born of the latest thinking. That's because FS specialists receive continuous training that keeps them current on the latest trends, practices, and technologies. So you'll get local expertise that's both exceptional and up-to-date. Visit FSSystem.com to learn how FS is bringing you what's next. Well, soybeans and meal had a solid day on Thursday once again, while quarter wheat relatively quiet all of this ahead of the uh, WASDI report for December out on Friday. Plenty of things to discuss in the trade. Let's bring in our good friend Brian Doherty, Senior Market Advisor at Total Farm Marketing, joining us here today. Brian, always a pleasure to catch up with you, sir. Hope you're having a good week so far. Jesse, no complaints. Uh, and beans had a good week. Really good export sales and the uh, highest prices since September. So yeah, nice week with 63 million bushels sold year to date. Uh, puts the total year to date 1.428 billion. And that's right in line with last year, 1.4235. So so, you know, South America, if they have good weather, maybe our exports slow, but sure looks like buyers are uh, kind of stepping up. Maybe they're a little more concerned about this Argentina crop than than maybe they were a week ago or two weeks mm-hmm. ago. Um, that's a kind of precarious place right now. La Nina should um, dissipate into December and January from what I'm reading, but um, Argentina is behind on its planting pace, and that's a sign of dry conditions. Definitely, definitely. I know that dryness in Argentina is a big story. I wonder if we'll see some changes in the WASDI report tomorrow on that. We'll talk about that in a second. But uh, more on the on the demand picture, Brian. Um, I, I've heard a little bit of rumor in the trade that you know China uh, is coming back to the U.S. because a lot of the Argentine beans, the cheap beans, are maybe going to crushers and not able to get whole beans to China. I just wonder how that picture, what you're seeing there. Uh, but again, I mean, nothing to complain about really, really right. good to yeah. those numbers. So, well, what's, what's interesting is uh, historically, uh, when I use the word historically in past years, um, Argentina has been a leading supplier to the world of soybean meal. And, and mm-hmm. I don't know, uh, you know, when we look at the bean complex, sure, we saw good export sales today, but the meal market, it's just skyrocketed lately, rallying 40 $50 a ton. Um, I'm just going to take a quick peek at that chart. And that has been the leader of this complex. Oil got hammered after the EPA, um, let's call them, um, I can't remember what the word, the right word is, but the EPA numbers, which mm-hmm. were a disappointment to the biofuels as the you know, EV cars or, uh, are counted as a credit toward the biofuels. So mm-hmm. kind of hammered the oil and the traders were quick to sell oil and buy meal. But I think the bigger story is just maybe some concerns out of Brazil, since they're such a large exporter of meal to the world, that all of a sudden you've got this meal market surging. And consequently, maybe the Brazilians are going to push their beans through their crushing plants rather than to China. So all of that makes some sense to me. Yeah, we went from, uh, let's see here on the March contract, from about 401 and a half. So basically, let's call it $400 at the very end of Mar- uh, November, this on the March contract. And now we're 462 today. And that's all in just a matter of days. So mm-hmm. big, big percentage increase. Uh, couple that with good export sales, and it's nice to see that the bean market uh, is kind of pushing toward that $15 level level trading at, like I said, its highest level, uh, depending on which contract you look at, but the highest level since early September or late August. You look at those charts in beans and meal specifically, Brian, I know we're, we're bumping up against some of those uh, resistance levels, some of that maybe technical resistance. What do you see on the charts? I mean, what's it going to take for us, I wonder, to get through some of those levels and hold through some of those levels possibly? I think it's going to take um, uh, a continued strong export sales where it just keeps that projected carryout number pretty snug. And probably a little bit of weather uncertainty just to keep the market, you know, on edge enough. And that's what we've got in Argentina. The market's on edge. Uh, We've kind of talked about this all along, that we've got some very sluggish overall market activity. Uh, I'm looking at the March bean contract. It's traded, let's just call it $13.75 to $15 since July. Now, got a little lower in in the early part of July. 
but this consolidation pattern. So we're back up toward this $15 mark, and that's where they've had a tough time pushing through. And, and I, I kind of get it. In the past, when we had a tough time pushing through, we were on the eve of harvest. Uh, U.S. farmers were selling, maybe even selling right out of the field, and then prices tipped over. Uh, and then farmers kind of stopped selling. And now it's, it's moving back to a level where farmers will probably start picking up their sales again. So to get it through that $15, either farmers just got to stop selling, uh, speculative interest has to gain a little traction, or whether in South America or all three. But weather's your dominant factor. Definitely. Let's switch over to this corn market. Uh, corn just remains sluggish. It's it's just kind of doggish. It doesn't seem to want to do much of anything, or at least I, I should say it seems like it, it, it likes to follow wheat lower, but then it doesn't like to follow wheat or any other market higher. I, I just, I, I kid a little bit there, but it is kind of true. I, I Look at this corn market, Brian. What stands out to you? You look at the charts. I mean, what do you make of this uh, this sluggish corn market right now? Well, I, th I think what the market's concerned about is if you look at the export sales year to date versus a year ago, we're about 750 million bushels on this morning's report, and that compares to 1.439 billion uh, a year ago at this time. So, so you're missing 700 million bushels compared to a year ago. So that mm -hmm. that's a big deal, and so the the likelihood that at some point the USDA could, and maybe tomorrow. Uh, again, chip away at this export sales number is, is the, the bigger concern. Um, now, you know, as we look ahead, are farmers going to more aggressively plant, uh, you know, soybeans versus corn, things like that? It's not really telling anybody to. I, I keep a tight eye on this ratio if you take November beans and divide it by December corn. So if I take November 23 bean futures divided by December 23 corn futures, right now that ratio is 2.35%. Typically, you need it around 2.45 to think that beans are going to take some acres from corn. Um, the world's a little different with input costs uh, every year and fertilizer availability and those kind of things. So maybe it doesn't have to be up to 2.45. But um, there's a lot of wheels kind of turning in a time window when typically it's pretty sluggish, and that is in the bean market. That mm -hmm. could be affecting the corn market, but right now corn is just, uh, to answer your question, it's just not perceptibly seeing the sales, and crude oil prices have been struggling between $70 and $80, and it rallied up to $80 and quickly took off $10. Um, you know, the corn has to have a vision of why an end user would more aggressively chase this thing, and right now there's no no vision of consequence. There's not enough weather in South America either. Well, Brian, thinking ahead to Friday's WASDE report, uh, I, I know typically this report, very quiet, probably the quietest of the year. There's usually not many big changes. It seems like the trade is expecting just minimal tweaks here and there maybe. It will kick the can to January. I, I wonder your thoughts, though, looking at what you're seeing and, and maybe hearing in the trade, I wonder – could we get a surprise out of USDA tomorrow? I think most likely not. But then again, how many times has USDA surprised us already this year, Brian? Uh, they have. I, I just don't know where the surprise would come from unless it's significantly negative on the exports. And they just say, okay, we're, we're, we're going at this too slow. We're never going to meet the pace. Um, I think it's a little early for that. But the pre-report estimate, so, so when you kind of, again, think about a funnel, and you put in you know, all your supply stuff, all your demand stuff, and you get that carry out or that leftover supply at the projected for the end of the marketing year, the market's anticipating that from November, when the number was 1.182 billion, it will rise to 1.241. So again, a little bit of a crawl higher, most likely 50 million bushels out of exports or some combination of you know exports and maybe ethanol, but probably the exports just continuing to kind of claw away at, uh, I'm going to say a response to what has not happened. And what has not happened is just some weeks of just these massive robust sales on corn. So a little bit of a challenge there. Um, the good news is, uh, at least in, in what I'm reading, is that and you got to think this is coming, that Mexico will kick the can down the road for another year on mm -hmm. these uh, idea of non-GMO corn only versus GMO. Um, there's no practicality to that for either nation that, you know, to, to enforce that in start of 2024. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point there. And I, I think it sounds like Mexico is going to kick it down the road at least a year. So we'll see if we can get some resolution. Wheat markets real quick. Uh, 
kind of a mixed blah day there. I know we've lost, um, you know, like two dollars or so in this wheat market here in the last couple of weeks. Uh, what do you make of wheat heading into the uh, WASD report? Um, uh, on the charts, oversold is what I make of wheat on the chart. Mm -hmm. Now, historically, again, if we looked at a long term chart, wheat still kind of a high price. Uh, it's not outrageous by any stretch, but anything over seven, eight dollars is still a lot of money for a bushel of wheat. Um, and and it's got this downward momentum. Uh, and one of the momentum measures that I would tell you is what is the what is the managed money doing? Where are the large speculators? And they have gone net short and they continue to add to short positions. So so when a market trends, and, and we've talked about this before, um, if you're making money, you just keep doing what you're doing to make money, and then you make more money, and you keep doing because you're making more. So it's easy, I think, for the funds. They've got people scared to buy because they've eaten their lunch. So I think the fund money or the managed money is able to go in and sell. Now, what's the backdrop of that? Well, the backdrop of that is that Russia seems to have this supply of wheat that continually can make its way to the world. This idea of uh, the world starving and all of that—it's on the back burner, despite the um, despite the uh, the continuation of um, despite the continuation of the war. Um, mm -hmm. So, so we have to see Australia's crop, despite some rain issues, still looks to be record large. And then, if in fact the uh, La Nina pattern does dissipate. That should mean more moisture chances for the Midwest. And we're starting to see some of that happen now. We were talking a little bit beforehand about how much moisture maybe you've got in Nashville where you're drying the drought monitor map. So at least there's moisture beginning to fall and you got some snowpack out west starting to develop. Brian Doherty, Total Farm Marketing, is our guest here today. Brian, let's switch over to livestock cattle trade first. Cash trade's been a little lower this week. That's something we haven't said uh, here for the last couple of months. Uh, but the futures board uh, reflected some good strength, it looked like, on the day Thursday. As you take a look at cattle, what are your thoughts there? Well, uh, no surprise necessarily that cash is weaker because Packers had gone into the red. So they can't keep pushing losses, um, or you wouldn't think that they would, and consequently they aren't. They're starting to lower their bids. So so there's that. There's this idea that most of the holiday buying is probably in place or done. So there's not mm -hmm. this urgency or cleanup need, or we're not getting signals that, boy, buy at all costs because it's moving out of the supermarket so quickly that they can't stock it fast enough. Not Not hearing that type of stuff. Big uptrend, uh, good, good, uh, good potential. Um, the meats have been very volatile lately. Uh, I look at the April contract and cattle peaking two weeks ago, and uh, you know, getting that 160 area, then quickly peeling off two or three dollars, but still choppy and still in the long term steady uptrend. So, I like the long term picture. We've talked about this before on uh, the droughty conditions and cattle on feed numbers, and slaughter numbers all seem to point toward a smaller herd mm -hmm. in 23 and maybe 24. Consequently, they keep support under the feeder market. Feeders up today, $1 to $2. Um, that that market's probably going to stay pretty robust. The hog market has been crazy volatile lately, mm -hmm. uh, $4 or $5 lower, $4 or $5 higher, uh, et cetera. So um, uh, that's, that's where that sits right now. Uh, just saying, volatile, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that hog market, very volatile. And really the only thing that's maybe held sort of steady in hogs is that front month December contract is keeping itself close to the index as it nears expiration. But other than that, everything else all over the place. And again, we saw it, you know, today down a couple of bucks in, in most of those deferred contracts, Brian. Yeah, you look at like this, this June contract, a nice sharp. Well, okay, so they got a pretty hard rally that to 105 in September. And then a pretty hard sell-off down the 95 uh, in October. And then by mid-October, rallied from 95 to 105 in a matter of three weeks. Then kind of steady higher. And then quickly took off $4 and quickly rallied back here last week. $6 now taken off $3. So it has been really, really volatile and jumpy. And one has to wonder, you know, I'm, I know I'm guessing I'm going to show my age in this a little bit when the pork belly market used to trade. It kind of reminds me what the pork bellies. They could be all over the map and 
fewer and fewer traders and you wonder if the hog market isn't kind of mirroring that a little bit where you just don't mm -hmm. have that much participation so you have some bigger orders come in it can push the market quite a bit but cash is king uh cash is uh we t you talked about the index there uh jess and uh, around 80 just a little under 83 summer months are holding a big premium to that so if you're a hog producer out there and you're seeing that 20 22 dollar premium that's a big run in cash just to get to where the board is so might be worth taking a look at treating defensively. I'm out the dairy market, Brian. I see plenty of red on Thursday's uh, screen there in dairy. Any yeah. updates? Well, the updates are just, and I'm not sure why, but but you got cattle on the one end, then you talk about demand concerns with, with milk, and maybe just disappointment that over the last week now we've seen this, I'm going to say this, unending news about China lifting COVID restrictions mm -hmm. and this and that. And the other thing that you'd kind of think there's some enthusiasm there that the export market will pick up. And yet there's this, this concern that maybe that's not going to do much more. And then you go back to the last milk production report production up what 1.2%. So there really isn't a bullish story right now. Butter was hot for a long time and yet cheese isn't quite finding it's, it's footing as kind of this leader that we're used to seeing. And maybe that's just, you know, we got just a, a, a tad bit too much supply, but um, I don't want to complain about 19 or $20 milk, but when you come off of a year where 24, $25 milk, and I don't think the fundamentals have changed that much, there's one of two things, either the market's undervalued right now or the market likely overvalued itself for a while and created probably in a sense of, uh efficiency in the industry where, where milk producers figured out how to produce a little bit more now this is kind of the leg that you get with that you get more supply brian great thoughts as always before we wrap it up today the floor is yours any final thoughts for us well tomorrow's pretty big it's a report day and typically uh as we indicated or you indicated this report isn't much of a mover but it still is a mover so um it, I, I'm struggling to find out where I'd find a bullish surprise. So if you've got a bunch of inventory on hand and kind of wringing your hands and stressing it out a little bit, I guess I would, uh, I'd probably say maybe before the report, create some sales and hope you're wrong. And if it, you know, the report's friendly or we get some positive reaction to it or prices are higher and some weather here in the next few weeks, you've got an opportunity to sell more. But things are kind of slipping between our fingers in the corn market a little sooner than no no one expects corn to stay at seven dollars forever you hope it goes higher everybody expects at some point the car market's going to go down you just hope mm -hmm. that it wasn't going to go down as soon as harvest wrapped up you kind of think it would hold as farmers kind of shut the bin doors and that just hasn't been the case so so everything's relative i've said this before if we're rallying up to 650 you feel pretty good if you're coming from seven to 650 you don't feel good it's still 650 corn so let that sink in well, Brian, if folks need a little advice, want to look at their marketing strategy with you and the team there at Total Farm Marketing, what's the best way to get a hold of you, Brian? Yeah, I, I would just ask that you give me a call, 800-334-9779. Um, uh, let's just, you know, have have a conversation if you have questions or how to implement strategy, those kind of things. Important stuff. you uh, you got two roles as a farmer. One is production. That's probably where most people love what they do. And the other one is, uh, you know, you're a marketer and you, you have to wear that I call inventory management hat. So if you need any help with that inventory management, at least on implementing ideas, uh, run it by somebody. And I'm, help, I'm more than willing to help anybody with that. And they have a great website too, totalfarmmarketing.com. With that, Brian Doherty, Total Farm Marketing. Always a pleasure, sir. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you, Jesse. Have a great day. Thank you, sir. That's going to do bet. it for Market Talk today. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.